thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, appreciate you spending your uh, Saturday here with me and learning about Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> so today, I'm going to talk about a project called PeerSwap. Uh, I can go to the next slide. So PeerSwap was originally announced in El Salvador last year at the Adopting Bitcoin conference by um, Warren Tagami, who uh, works at Blockstream. And uh, yeah, so what they're trying to solve is the problem of how to keep your channels balanced in a, in a Lightning network. I'll just point, Steve, when it's time. Um, <clears throat> and you know, this is basically a problem that any decentralized payment network is going to have because you know there's no coordinator to say you know if, if you've got three or four hops between different people that you're paying, it's you know easy if the flows go one way or the other. So go ahead, next slide. So this is just one example of like a particular sort of a, a, a typical situation where you can have an unchained, an out of balance channel. So this is just an example. There's their balance and your balance. And if you're an end user, you maybe got a mobile wallet. It's not all, it's not on all the time. Um, perhaps you're only using it to spend. So maybe you're only buying gift cards or something and you're not doing any routing and it, it, you're not currently receiving any money. But what's going to happen is the balance that you originally started on in that channel will eventually flow to the other side of, of your channels, you know, more than one channel. Um, so, yeah, go ahead, next slide. Another scenario, which is sort of the mirror opposite, is if you're running something like bit refill. So you're selling gift cards. Um, you're not necessarily, you could be doing some routing, but mostly you're just receiving a lot of inflows of, of lightning. So all of the channel balance of all of your channels will eventually flow to your side. So you're only receiving no routing and no spending. And now, yeah, so... and. And what's more is if you're in this situation where you're a merchant, you can't just leave it in the channels because they paid you for something that you have to, you know, you have cost of goods sold. You have to eventually get that money out and, and sell it for dollars sometimes to pay for whatever gift cards it was that, you know, you sold for, for Lightning. Go ahead. And then even if you're a routing node, like I was saying from the beginning, it's it's a random sort of network. There's no planning. So there's a good chance that you could end up with a few of your channels that just become unbalanced. And what you're advertising, this is, you know, an important fact about Lightning, what you're advertising to everybody in a public way is the total capacity. So like 10 dots up here. What you're not advertising is the exact balance of which side that, you know, that Bitcoin happens to be on, you know, where the Satoshis are in that channel. So you can get into a situation where you're advertising a, perhaps a very large channel. Somebody's going to try to route through you, but because it's all on the wrong side and, and you can't advertise, you know, where it is for privacy reasons. And maybe I could take a slight digression. You know, why would you not want to just tell the whole network wherever, where all your balance is on either channel? The reason is if, if somebody were, if you were advertising that, then it would be pretty easy to figure out when a payment goes from one node to the other to the, the destination. You could just see that balance flowing if you were advertising that information and somebody, then you would lose the privacy aspects. And, and, you know, that's, that's a, a key component of lightning is you don't want people to know. So the, the end result is if you will end up with routing failures. And that's bad for somebody who's running a professional node for many reasons. One is that, that people are going to route through you less. If you have a routing failure, the algorithms are just going to say, okay, something wrong with that channel. We're just not going to route through them. So then you lose routing fees and that liquidity is just going to be stuck there until you rebalance the channel and make it usable again because you will get tried again by the algorithm. Uh, go ahead. Um, okay, so what are the solutions? Next slide. So sort of the naive solution, I did this too when I first ran a lightning node. I said, oh, I got one channel that's one way and one channel that's the other way. I'm just going to circular rebalance. I'm going to send a payment from this, you know, through some hops and, and, and balance them out. And that does sound good in theory. Um, and you can do it sort of a straight way too. If you have maybe two wallets, you can try to move liquidity from one to the other. Um, go to the next slide. The problem is you don't know who, what the balances are of all those other nodes that you're routing through. And, um, you know, it's, there, there are some fees involved, but the biggest uncertainty is you just don't know where their balances are. And I think in practice from, you know, what, what people have experienced is that it often fails. And when it doesn't fail, it just leads to people then rebalancing back through you. You know, that's, it's, it doesn't really solve the problem. It just moves it around. It just moves it from one set of nodes to some other set of nodes. And as a sort of, as a lightning operator, you, you actually want a system that will preserve the usability of the network in total. You don't want to just sort of push this problem around. So 
multi-hop rebalancing is really not a solution that, that will work in any way. Go ahead, next slide. Um, the other way that uh, Warren talked about in his presentation is that you can open new channels. And that's unfortunately sort of the way they recommend people doing it nowadays is they say, okay, when one channel's out of balance, well, you just open a new channel and then you'll have... So if you're in that first case where you're the person who is just buying a lot of things with their lightning balance, you, you can just open a new channel. So you put more Bitcoin, transfer, tra lock it into a channel, and now you've got more outgoing balance. Or the merchant could just close his channel, take the Bitcoin from closing it, do what he needs to do and open a new channel. Um, but, but that isn't the perfect solution either. So yeah, so you can minimize, uh, yeah, so the, and the problems are that there are on-chain TX fees. So you, you, every time you do that, you're incurring an on-chain transaction, um, which, you know, is not ideal. And especially as lightning adoption grows, that's going to add a lot of traffic and really jump up fees. Um, yeah, the other thing too is if, yeah, I was going to say, so like more in hot wallets too. If you're opening up channels and you're not closing the channels that you already had, then what happens is you've got a lot of liquidity that's in your Lightning wallet, which is more at risk than if it were in your cold wallet. If it was something on chain, it's not at risk in the same way as your Lightning balance is at risk. So, you know, that's, that's an efficiency issue, but also a safety issue to not having just unused channels with the hopes that you'll rebalance them later, for example. So you really want to keep, you want to make the most use of the liquidity you have in the most efficient way possible but also have as much off-chain as you can. You don't want to have on-chain or, yeah, you want to have as much on-chain and not as much in your hot wallet. Um, so next slide. Now there's other solutions and these are quite popular. So there's companies that will sell you liquidity. So if you're, um, especially if you're somebody who needs to receive balances, so if you're a new merchant or you're maybe getting donations, um, you can go to these services and they'll sell you a channel. So that, what that means is they connect to you. So let's say uh, 2 million sats or something. You know, you pay them 2 million sats plus, no, no, sorry, you don't pay them 2 million sats because that, that's inbound liquidity. So you pay them some fee and they lock up 2 million sats in a channel directed at your node. And that means is anybody who pays you can go through that inbound channel and, you know, draw down that 2 million sats as payments and they get some fees from that. But what they're really concerned about is they, they sell it to you for the cost, uh, for some profit, but also for the cost that they incur to do the on-chain channel open, because it's the one who opens the channel who pays the fees as far as on-chain. So they pay a fee to open the channel, a fee to potentially unilaterally close it. So if you disappear on them, then they're going to have to, there's a, there's a fee for the on-chain transaction to close it, plus they're tying up that liquidity for usually in most of these places, like 30 days. Um, I guess go to the next slide. Yeah. So this is just an example of some of these terms and conditions. So they got no guarantee. They'll keep it open for more than a month. Um, certain fees are involved and, and they want to make a little profit on it too, because you know, they're tying up 2 million sats that they could be using for routing or for something else. So if you're, uh, they, they can't know how much you're going to use that. Um, next one. And then the other problem is centralization. You know, when you've got a few big liquidity producers, there's like three on there, maybe there's five total. That creates a central point of failure where, where if somebody wanted to come and say, you know, we're going to shut down Lightning or we're going to put some surveillance on Lightning, they could go to those, those hubs and they could uh, watch them or shut them down or put KYC regulation. Who knows what they could do? Um, so you really don't want all of your liquidity providers to be some small group of professional businesses. You would rather them be spread out and, you know, be a larger group of, uh, of participants in that, that whole mix. Uh, next slide. So that's where peer swap comes in. So the idea of peer swap is rather than, um, closing a channel, for example. So A and B in this slide, this is Warren's slide. Maybe it starts. These two nodes have it all on A side. So what they do is they agree to rebalance it to 50-50, and in this case, B, uh, no, sorry, yeah, B would pay on-chain, um, I guess, the other 50%. So the one channel, the A channel, pays B via a lightning invoice, and in exchange, B creates an on-chain transaction which pays A on-chain. Um, now, some criticism of that could be, well, you're doing an on-chain transaction, but all of those other 
uh, techniques that I had mentioned are also creating an on-chain transaction. But here, you're not creating a new channel. You're not closing the old channel, opening a new channel. You're actually just doing an on-chain transaction. And there's, there's actually some, I didn't talk about this here, but there's also some privacy aspects to that too, because that on-chain transaction isn't necessarily going to be correlated with this happening. So there's a, there's a privacy aspect to that too. Uh, next one. So some of the advantages of doing this peer swap technique. So it's simple in that it works with existing lightning nodes today. Now that's not entirely true because you do have to support a few more messages. And I'll, I'll go through the a little more technical depth later, but um, it's essentially using existing lightning nodes with a few optional additional messages to negotiate this peer swap. But in theory, anybody running any LN, any lightning node could be a peer swap producer. Um, and in theory, it also should be the lowest cost because you're already working with a guy, you know, you're working with another node that you already have a channel with. So it's in both of your interests to rebalance that channel if, if, if you agree to it. Um, and it's reliable because it's single hop. So unlike the circular rebalancing or some of these like linear rebalancing techniques, you're only one hop away from where you're getting this liquidity. So it should be quite um, reliable compared to a lot of other ways you could go. Uh, next one. And as I said before, fully decentralized too. So you're not relying on just a small set of companies doing this. And um, there's no coordinator, no third party data collection. So, you know, your peer knows, but your peer already knows your balance. So you're not giving up any information that your peer doesn't already have. Um, and then uh, I guess the next one. So you don't need to open up more channels. Um, it reduces the hot wallet risk that I was discussing before. And reduces your cost of capital because you don't have a lot of sort of zombie channels that are open. Um, and also having more channels, um, well, I don't know what you meant there, but it's more unproductive. Yeah, it's more unproductive to have more channels. You'd rather just have one large channel and have it working the way, you know, having it balanced. Or sometimes if you're a merchant, you maybe you want a, a large channel, but on one side. So you have higher success. Um, you don't need to pay for it. You don't need to pay for incoming capacity, although you might have to. Um, find a peer that you know is willing to go on chain, um, but it's something you would have to do anyway. Go ahead, next slide. So yeah, so this is just going to re recapitulate that. So if you're a merchant, you're in the situation where the balance is on the other side. Or sorry, yeah, it was originally all we had the entire balance on our side, but then after peer swap, the balance shifts back so that we can receive it, and then. Um, we get Bitcoin. So it's pretty uh, attractive, I think, for merchants, especially who do need to regularly close out their channels in order to get the liquid, you know, to get on chain that they could then use to purchase their merchandise. Um, so it creates, it creates a, with a single channel partner, you can sort of rotate this over and over again rather than closing and reopening uh, the channel there. Next one. And again, same with the end user example. So, um, you know, you've spent all your Bitcoin. Now, rather than cl closing that channel or reopening a new channel with a Bitcoin deposit, um, I use the example of Phoenix. So I, I, I'm working with Async now, and they have a they have a way where you can deposit Bitcoin. You know, they give you a QR code, you send on-chain Bitcoin, and then they send you a balance. This would be an alternative to doing that, um, but a more decentralized alternative that then keeps the existing channel, but just they shift the liquidity back in your side, and then they get a, a UTXO. They get an on-chain balance. Um, Okay, next one. So for mobile wallets, especially, I think this could be really attractive. And routing nodes, you know, the routing nodes, I think, are probably the most sophisticated operators of, of Lightning nodes, you know, more than merchants, perhaps, but definitely more than most people with a, a mobile node. And they, they, they know, you know, they have a history. They, they really do the data analytics to see which way flows are going through channels. And so it gives them an additional tool they can use with their peers to either create some channels that are equally balanced, maybe some are more shifted one way or shifted the other way, and that can dynamically change. Um, but it allows them to do that with the channels they have. And especially for a professionally run routing node, they're very sensitive to how much, they're, they're very sensitive to the amount of data they have or amount of Bitcoin they have that is, that is in a hot wallet, because that's, that's their, one of their biggest risks really is, is their hot wallet getting attacked. But even more so, how much liquidity, the, the size of their business is based on how much Bitcoin they have in Lightning channels. So if they can make better use of the Lightning channels they have, 
then it's um, it's a, a big win for them. I, I, I saw some statistics where they, they were showing that the amount of Bitcoin tied in the Lightning Network at some point went down. And I thought it was fascinating, the explanation for that. And it, it makes sense in this context too. And that is, it isn't that people were sort of becoming less interested in Bitcoin or becoming less interested in Lightning. It was that people figured out how to manage their channels. So they didn't need as many redundant, unused channels. So this is just another tool to help Lightning operator, node operators, manage that liquidity and have a more efficient use of it, which you know benefits the whole ecosystem for sure. Okay, next. So this is the current status. So um, right now, um, um, Konstantin Nick, who works for Donner Labs, or he has his business Donner Labs, he teamed up with Blockstream, and they've already created two plugins, one for Core Lightning and one for LND, which does this already. And it, so they already have a working implementation of this as plugins for these two implementations. And uh, currently it's being tested on a Signet. So they have a Signet. So anybody who wants to try this with their node, like not using real Bitcoin yet, but, but sort of a fully functional implementation can do that. So it's, it's quite advanced for something that started as an idea uh, not too long ago. Uh, and yeah, anybody that, that link there I'll be in, will be in the slide. Um, now I'll just talk a little bit for anybody who's a little bit more interested in the technical details, what is actually going on. Um, so this is just one example of a scenario where um, somebody wants to swap in. So swap in means uh, this would be the scenario where uh, I guess it would be the wallet person. So so I'm I'm somebody who has I want to trade you an on chain on chain balance, and in exchange you're going to send some off chain lightning sats to me. Um, and the way the nodes negotiate that. So these are where it says swap in request. That middle column there, those are just additional messages that are added to the Lightning protocol. And this could be done a few different ways. I mean, they did it with uh, plugins. Um, you can also just, you know, change the main node implementation to support it. Um, so the initiator would, perhaps as a user command, a CLI command, you would say, you know, I want to swap in a million Satoshis and give it a channel ID. So then that would trigger a message, the swap in request being sent to the responder. And they're just in a state where they're waiting for a swap. Um, if they agree, if it looks like something that, that they want to do, it's uh, well formed, then they're going to send a swap agreement back. And then the initial initiator will then at that point, drop the opening transaction on chain and send a message that says this is the opening transaction um, broadcast information, which includes a invoice to to be paid by the other side. Okay, next one. And in the in the happy case, so the happy path of all this, um, at that point, the initiator is just waiting for the claim payment. So they're just waiting for that invoice that they gave the other side to be paid. Um, what the other side will do is first they'll just validate that it's a valid opening TX. So they'll look at the the information they were sent on chain and make sure that it it follows the rules. Um, then they'll pay it. So that's where the lightning invoice gets sent, uh, gets paid, just negotiated through standard lightning. And as a result of that negotiation and that, that settlement of the, of the on chain or the off chain lightning, they will receive a uh, pre image. So this is, if anybody knows sort of how the, the basics of lightning work, that's essentially what you're buying is you're buying a pre image. And that's when it's a settled lightning payment. Um, and with that pre image, they have all the information they need to um, take this on-chain transaction, which is claimed by invoice. So it's a, this is the atomic swap part of it. So there's no way that one party could say, get, get their lightning balance updated, but not be able to claim the other side, not be able to claim it on-chain. So this is really, it's an old technology from, you know, like earliest smart contracts use this idea. Um, but this is where it happens in the, in the system here. Uh, next slide. Another situation that could occur, just if you want to cover all your bases, is maybe, um, I don't know, your battery on your phone dies. So you aren't, you aren't able to, well, actually, no, that's, that's a different scenario. Um, maybe while you're negotiating this, while you're waiting for the on-chain TX to clear, a lot of uh, balance goes through your nodes, and now you don't have the liquidity to pay the other side, or, or something like that occurs, for whatever reason. You don't have to... Um, the side that has that was going to pay the invoice can also just send you a message 
that says it's a cooperative close. So they send you a signature, which allows the person who created the opening transaction to just say, okay, like I'll close it. And, um, sort of no harm, no foul. I mean, they're out the, they're out the, um, TX fees and I'll get to that later, but, um, but there is that path. Um, next one. And then the sort of final fail safe is if, if you do like your battery runs out on your phone and they aren't able to complete that side of it or the other side isn't able to complete, they just stop responding entirely. These contracts have this built in CSV. So, um, check sequence verified. This means after so many blocks, the person who created the opening TX can just sweep it back. So you're not dependent. And this is just a way, this is how all Bitcoin contracts need to be written so that you're covering all the bases. So there's no, there's no way for somebody to, um, take advantage of the other side and, and somehow get value without giving the value. Um, okay. Next slide. So what's in the future? Um, so I told you there's already plugins, um, for both C lightning, core lightning, sorry, core lightning and LND, but what they don't have yet, but will soon have is Taproot. So Taproot would just make these contracts much cheaper on chain because they'll be smaller. Also more private. You won't be able to see, you know, if you do it through the happy path, you probably, well, in the actual way they're looking at doing it, the, there should be a way so that, um, if in, in the scenario where it goes through, you may not know the other sides of the, the other paths. So it could just look like a normal Taproot transaction. You might not even know that, um, that it was part of a peer swap, which is great for privacy. Um, and also Blockstream, you know, they have a, something called the Liquid Network. So that's a side chain. Um, and part of what they built into their proposal was a way to do swaps for things other than on-chain lightning. So you could do it for on-chain uh, or liquid USDT. So you could do it for liquid tether. Um, that's, you know, that's something that Blockstream is really interested in. And I don't know if everybody will support it. But it certainly um, could be useful for some applications, especially people who really need to have a USD balance. Maybe they want it. They don't want to swap for um, Bitcoin. They want to swap for some sort of a stable coin. Uh, and then other implementations. And that's what I'm working on. So I'm um, the async team. Uh, I'm working with them to do uh, implementation for Eclair. And Eclair um, or the async uh node is one of the largest, I think it is perhaps the largest routing node on the Lightning Network. So I think that's a big, big uh, vote of confidence that async is willing to support this project. Uh, okay, next. Uh, there are still some open issues. Um, it's the way it's currently implemented, if you use the plugin, is there's an allow list. So you don't just let any one of your peers do these swaps. Um, mostly because of the, I, I believe the biggest problem is the one I mentioned, if you are the one who does the on-chain transaction and then the other side disappears. You don't necessarily, I mean, you, you do lose some money. So there is a, uh, you lose some fees. So there's a, um, mostly it's like a griefing kind of attack. It's not like the other guy gets it. Um, and, and that works into the other thing is in some of the other scenarios that I didn't run through, I might propose, I might, if I'm the one who proposes the transaction and does the on-chain, then it's probably, I'm probably not griefing you because I'm the one who would lose on-chain fees. That was the swap in scenario. But in the swap out scenario, I go to, I propose to your node, you put something on chain and I'll send you lightning. And in that scenario, they could grief you. So, um, there's ideas around providing a, uh, some sort of a price or premium that they pay you before it happens or, or, or as it happens. So, um, so these are just open issues about how you want to price these swaps so that it's fair and people conform and, and security is about whether you, like maybe if you're a large routing node, you only whitelist people who you have a lot of history with. You don't just do it with people who just joined your, you know, just opened a channel with you. So I think that's something that will evolve as people get more experience doing it this way. Okay. Next. Um, yeah. So more information. Uh, there's a really great website, pureswap.dev. So anybody wants to read more about this, they have, uh, a lot of stuff and there's a video, this second link. I mean, you can look at the slides and see this link. Um, this is the, you can look at the presentation they did in El Salvador. Um, they go through some interesting things there. Uh, next. And, uh, yeah, I just, uh, thanks to Warren Tagami and, and Constantine Nick for putting this together and, um, happy to be working on it because I think it's going to really help and be a useful uh, addition to the Lightning Network for sure. And very, very much thank you to Async for supporting this work and 
all that they do. <laughs> they do a lot for lightning. Um, okay. And that's it, I guess. Uh, and thank you all too <laughs> for being here. Okay. Yeah. One more slide. I think I have a question. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. How often do you expect these types of, so this is purely for rebalancing. So, yeah. Um, how often do you expect these on chain transactions to happen? And what frequency do, do these rebalancings need to occur? And, like, what effect do you think that's going to have on the block space of the main chain? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think there's really a way to predict because I think it'll vary quite a lot. I mean, if you're bit refill, you know, they have some rate in which their channels fill up and then they'll have to do one of these peer swaps at that rate, but they would have to do something anyway. So it won't probably change. It won't have any noticeable effect in that regard. Uh, if anything, it might have a, a, might sort of reduce the frequency because maybe they could reuse larger channels instead. And so then they could do it less often. So. I think that's to be determined. It'd be great to see somebody who's got like a data analytics background try to suss that out. I mean, you probably have to get data from, from those guys, but it's, it's not on main chain yet. So I think until it gets onto main chain, we might have a hard time seeing it's what already happening. Really, it's, it's yeah, it's happening. More yeah. It's, it's not happening through peer swap, but people are doing kind of a manual swap. You know, they're manually closing channels and reopening new channels right now. So the on chain effect is already. There, I don't think it'll be worse. I think the expectation is it'll be better yeah. on chain. So, yeah, yeah. So, this is something that's completely automated transactions, or is it both node operators can be on at the same time? Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, that's a good a good question. I don't think uh, we know right now. It's just in testing, so people are literally on the command line. Sort of approving it, um, but it could be automated. I think that's the point. Is you could certainly. I mean, the way I envision doing this, you know, as I implement this for async, is you probably would set up sort of some sort of policy. You know, first, I want the node to be on a whitelist, or I want them to be have a certain age with me. Second of all, I would say, um, like, I'm willing to take a swap as long as the premium covers my on-chain fees or or 50 percent of my on-chain fees or something like that. So you probably would set up some policies. If it, if it rebalances in a way that I want and if, if the fees are something I, I feel are fair, then you could do it in an automated fashion and nodes could just do that. Um, so I think, I think it's automatable more so than going to like one of these other providers. I don't know. Maybe they have APIs. So maybe there is, but then if you had an API for LN big or one, one ML, unless they come up with a standard for APIs that you would have to sort of implement multiple APIs here. We're really going for something that every node could implement. And once you have, you know, once you have that, you could just build in sort of a standard, um, you know, yeah, then it could be automated basically. Nodes could just use that lightning sort of native way. Yeah. Wouldn't that also mean that you have a hot wallet on lightning, but also an on chain hot wallet as well? Because it depends. Well, you have a lot of channel wallet. Yeah, I mean, managing your on-chain, some some nodes have, like, a, I think LND has one built into their node, whereas Async and I think Core Lightning both use Lightning Core. So that is your, it's a, it is a hot wallet, but you could, for example, you could have a sweep addresses and then manually put those back into the hot wallet. So you could, in theory, like, if you were a merchant, you might have, you might be able to say, like here's a here's a descriptor for where I want f funds that flow out to like that come from a swap and go on chain. I want them to go to this cold storage. So you could do something like that, um, or you could. I mean, you could. To send it, that's true. Yeah, you would have to have some on chain. That's true. You would have if you're if you're if the swapping that you tend to be doing is. To like, I mean, I think of it more from the user standpoint. You've got a mobile wallet. If I want to make some purchase and oh, I don't have enough, you know, liquidity on my side, I'm going to do, I'm going to, at that point, I'll probably do a manual from my, you know, my green wallet or whatever. I'll, I'll send it to my lightning wallet at that point. So that would be not automated. Yeah. Um, if I mean, maybe in, like somebody who's running an automated, uh, you know, routing node, they, they would certainly have some liquidity that they use for swaps and yes, then that would be a hot wallet for that. 
but it wouldn't have to be their whole balance. You know, it would be, it could be less than what they would just have tied up in channels. Otherwise, if they didn't have peer swapping. And it could also be a little bit safer too. I mean, it just gives them an option how to do that. I mean, if they want to do it in an automated way, but they may not do it. I mean, if you're really actively managing a node, you probably, you might actually do it. You might run a report and say, okay, these guys are out of balance. I'm going to set up these swaps. And so I think it just depends on the operator, how much they automate. Yeah, you could batch them. I mean, they, if you're really running this like as a business, you might say, okay, I know Sunday nights, this is a good time to do it. So I'm going to set up a bunch of batch rebalances. And yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, I think people who are running big nodes do that manually now. They run a report, they get sort of, you know, they decide, okay, this is the time to do it. This is what we want to do, and then boom, they do it. Um, so it would be like that for those node operators, but instead of closing and reopening or closing, waiting for everything to go through and then reopening at a later, you know, a month later, they would just set up the swaps and let those finish up. And then, and then maybe they would sweep things back in or out of their on-chain wallet um, based on what they need. Uh, and there's also, I mean, this is not in the proposal, but as I think about this, you could imagine perhaps too, you've got one where you're swapping on-chain, uh, you know, some channels going on-chain and you've got another where you want to swap from on-chain back into Lightning, you could, in theory, daisy-chain those two. I mean, as long as the first one went through, it would fund the opening of the second one. And then that would also give you a savings of on-chain. So I think people can get sophisticated about this if you're really looking to optimize. <laughs>